Our accumulator is a welded assembly consisting of three main parts. The main casing on the bottom shown here in, in purple, green, and orange, and two lids. The right lid, which I will call the service lid, is easy to remove for general maintenance. The left lid, which is harder to remove, houses all the input-output connectors and a few tractor system components. Here I'll show you the general assembly of our accumulator. First the segments are installed, and then plastic insulating barriers are placed on top of the inner walls of the accumulator. Here's what those look like. They wrap completely around the wall and help constrain the batteries vertically. Then Kevlar panels are placed on top of these walls and taped in place. Here's what that looks like in real life. Following this, a Kevlar panel with the rest of the accumulator components can be installed on top of this. A spacer goes on top of the box. The first lid, the main lid, gets installed, and then the service lid gets installed. Besides any tractor system connections, all hardware within the accumulator is plastic. There is the notable exception of the bolts which hold the Kevlar sandwich panel floor down. These bolts thread into these aluminum pieces shown here, which are then threaded into the outside walls of the accumulator. Thus, a ground path is created directly to those. These bolts, and the safety wire that constrains them, are all taped over with Kapton insulating tape. You may see these blank plastic covers, which purely serve to act as segment isolation after the maintenance bolts have been disconnected. Now that I've given you a brief overview of our accumulator, let's follow along in the rules spreadsheet to check each item off the list. Here we are with our accumulator with the main lid and service lid off. This PCB here is the only PCB which is team designed, which has high voltage and low voltage both on it. Uh, this side is low voltage and this side is high voltage, with this crosshatch section here being the interface between the two. Over here is the same PCB without the components, and the DIP-8 package here is the closest between the two, uh, the high voltage and low voltage sides of the PCB. If we measure it, it is six millimeters apart, thus it requires conformal coating. If we go back to the PCB in the accumulator and shine a UV light on the uh, conformal coat, you can see that it eliminates. And if we go to the back side, you can see that it is also conformal coated here. And here is the same PCB, uh, uncoated, for reference. The battery temperature sensing harness is part of the GLV circuit, while the battery cell voltage taps for the BMS is part of the tractive system circuit. Therefore, the temperature sensing harness has DR25 heat shrink wrapped around it for insulation measures, and as you can see, when the harness comes into the upper portion of the accumulator, it continues with the DR25 heat shrink over all temperature sensing connections here. The wiring here is the cell voltage tap wiring. This wire, this harness here, is part of the GLV harness. It is the GLV harness. It is completely wrapped in DR25 heat shrink up to all the connectors. This is the main branch of the harness, and it also goes down in here next to the BMS, and it is completely wrapped in the DR25 heat shrink for insulation. For the cell-to-cell -cell bus bars, there are metal tab washers which go under the bolts. After the bolts are torqued to spec, the tabs are bent up around the bolt heads to prevent them loosening. For our segment-to-segment -segment connections, we use these custom-machined Bradlock pins, and to prevent them from loosening, we use a plastic piece which looks just like this. It has a uh, hexagonal pattern here, which fits over this uh, hex in the radlock. So when you torque the radlock to spec, then you uh, simply take this plastic piece and put it over that, and it is just the right thickness and width and everything to be right up against a plastic piece right next to it, or a wall right next to it, or whatever it may be, to prevent it from loosening. Here you can see the insulation lining the inside of our accumulator, which was applied before cell assembly. Most of it is a Kevlar Aramid fabric to act as insulation, and the edges are sealed with the Kapton tape listed on our ESI. The bottom side of both lids are similarly covered with either the Aramid paper or the Kapton tape for insulation. Here, again, I'm just showing that the tops of each segment are insulated just as the sides are. The tops, however, are insulated with um, prepaid Kevlar, which we cured ourselves, and sealed on the sides with Kapton tape. The high current path starts right here at the negative pole of the accumulator and runs through this wire to where the energy meter would be if we had one, and that is what this connector here is for. This bolt here has a jam nut on the back such that the clamping stack up is purely metal here and the plastic component here, which actually holds the head of the bolt, is just used to maintain the location of the bolt, not to actually clamp the, in the high current path. The energy meter then comes from this bolt through this bus bar, through the current sensor, to the negative uh, contactor, and then up through this bus bar to here. From here it connects to the lid, right here through this bolt, which has a nylon lock nut on the back. It then carries through the high voltage disconnect to the main connector there, the main output connector, which has nylon lock nuts on the back, and then through the fuse here, which carries the, the entire current of the output, with a nylon lock nut on the back, it then comes down to the positive contactor here, which I will show you in just a second. There you go. Uh, and then from here to the positive pole of the accumulator right there. The contactors are shielded from the rest of the accumulator using these Kevlar panels, which are just taped in place and relieved for wire wear there, and this one you can see right there between the BMS and the contactor is shielded, and I will show that to you in a second, what it looks like with the lid on, because the lid comes on top and kind of covers them up some more. There are a total of three tractive system connectors, one here, one here, if you're counting the high voltage disconnect, and one here, each having an interlock. This is the interlock connection for the tractive system measuring points connector, this is it for the high voltage disconnect, and this is it for the main output connector. The ARs separate the 
accumulator from the inverter or whatever load you may have. And there are only three tractor system low current connections. One here for the discharge circuit, which must be after the HVD. And two here, which go on both poles of the positive contactor, which are for the precharge circuit. These wires are spliced off here with these fuses, which you can see are 200 milliamp rated for the IMD and the energy meter. Now that the lid is installed, I can show you the secondary isolation between the contactors and the rest of the battery pack. Here you can see the negative contactor. There you can see the um, nylon lock nuts also tightened down with several threads showing on top. Here's the other contactor with a lid just made of Kevlar. There is the fuse with the bottom portion of the um, secondary isolation. And, and here you can see the second piece of Kevlar taped around the fuse in there. Here are the female radlock connectors, and you can see that all surfaces are insulated, except for right there where it slides over the pin. For the two maintenance plugs in this corner, which are tied to the lid that's currently installed, they're trimmed in such a way that they can only reach the radlock pins which belong to them. If I lift this one out of the way and pull on this, you can see that this is as far as it can go, and it can only reach this pin, which is the one it's supposed to go to. If I now push that one out of the way, play with this one, it can reach the pin it's supposed to, but it cannot reach over here. And if I try and bend it back or push it in and reach the first pin, it may not reach. It will not reach. For these four pins on the right in the rear, proper installation of the maintenance plugs is maintained by barriers both in front, rearwards, and to the left of these four pins. Remember that with the main lid off and the service lid to the left installed, that we only have these three maintenance plugs, these three segment connections to work with. These two belong on these four pins, and this one does not. These two are trimmed short enough that they can only reach all across like this and like this, and they are not long enough to bend and be installed like this without intersecting through the barrier, which of course is impossible. If I take this longer wire here, which goes in the front and does not belong here, it cannot connect between these two without intersecting either the wall of the accumulator or one of the barriers. It cannot intersect like this without going through the barriers. And while this one does look promising, you can see that it still, oops, just a second. You can see that it still creates such a big loop because of the bend radius that it must go through the barriers for it to be installed improperly. And this fact is maintained regardless of which two pins, like that, or like that, or like this, or that, that you try to install it on. Thus, for these four pins, only one possible configuration is possible using the two correctly sized segment connections. For these four pins in the back, one, two, three, and four, one of the wires remains on with the service lid, or sorry, with the service lid off and the main lid installed. This wire has a constraint right here such that it cannot loop vertically and can only reach this pin. If we try and bend it back to reach this pin, it is immediately obvious that that is not possible. If we take the two smaller wires that we have available to us, they are trimmed too short to reach between these pins. And although they might be able to reach between these two pins, the walls are too close to allow this connection to bend in that configuration, as you can see right here. The only possible configuration for these four pins is for this connection to go onto this radlock pin here, and for this longer wire of the three that we have available to us to bridge between these two right here. Here I'm just showing that the radlocks are capable of being removed by hand. Um, the video has been sped up quite a bit. It is a little bit difficult to remove all of these. The front two come out pretty easy, and the uh, back two in the corner uh, come out pretty easy, but as you're about to see, the uh, back two uh, in the right side of the car are pretty hard to remove, and it takes me a while. And we're nearing the end here, and uh, all this was just to show that it is possible to remove the red locks, albeit a little bit difficult, uh, completely by hand. This is our charging card with two orange leads for charging, one of which is for the tractive system measuring points, which can be found here, and one of which is for the actual charging, which is both of which use the same connectors as the car, both containing interlocks. This is the tractive system portion of our charging cart. The charger Charger has three connections, one for low voltage, one for an AC input, and one for the high voltage DC charging leads. Both connections have TPA assurance, as you can see here in red. And if you look inside the connector, in the center there is an interlock circuit, which is connected to the internals of the charger. The charger has a number of safety systems, including inrush current limiting and under voltage over voltage detection. Thus, if voltage is not detected at this connector, uh, the charger will not start charging. This means that all tractor system connections must be connected properly for the shutdown circuit to engage, and this connection must be connected properly for the charger to be activated, along with this connection for can communications, and this connection to actually power the charger itself.